right, good afternoon, and thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm just going to introduce um, Miriam Friedman, who is our um, guest here this afternoon. Um, Miriam is an assistant professor at Penn State in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, she graduated from Swarthmore College with a BA in chemistry and a minor in math. Um, and then she received um, a master's from the University of Minnesota in math, followed by another master's um, from the University of Chicago in chemistry. Um, she was then awarded an NSF graduate fellowship and completed a PhD in chemistry, also from the University of Chicago in 2008. Um, and then she was awarded a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoc Fellowship, which she completed here in Boulder at CU with Maggie Tolbert. Her research interests are primarily in heterogeneous processes, and today she'll be talking about the structure of atmospheric particles and impacts on climate change, climate, sorry, atmospheric chemistry and climate. Okay? Um, so thanks for that introduction, and thanks very much for um, having me here and for switching your seminar time to have me here on Tuesday. Um, so like Becky was saying, I want to talk to you today about the structure of atmospheric particles, and I'll motivate why we're interested in structure in, in just a few slides. Um, first, I want to motivate what I'm talking about in general in the talk. Um, and I'm going to use the background of this picture, which is a picture of um, Nindy Valley, and um, State College is over to the Oh, okay. I guess I will have to use the pointer on the computer. Where is the long pointer? Where is the long pointer? Oh, I see. I think it's up on the back. It's up on the back. Oh, okay. Um, maybe I'll use my mouse. Okay. So, um, so the State College is, is over in this area of the picture. Um, and basically, today I want to talk to you about two different topics. Um, I want to talk to you first about, oh, nothing is working. OK, that's funny. All right, anyway, um, that'll make sure that I stay in this area. So that's good, too. Um, so the first project I want to talk to you about has to do with ice nucleation um, and how ice nucleates on particles and how they influence ice clouds. Um, and the second project I want to talk to you about has to do with organic aerosol and phase separation in organic aerosol. Um, but first, I want to start um, with why we're interested in particles in general. And you guys all know this, but four slides of review is not too bad, so I'll go through it anyway. So we're interested in particles both for their impacts on human health and for climate. So in terms of human health, particles less than 2.5 microns in diameter can be breathed very deep into the lungs. And they're, um, they're, um, they cause or they can cause cardiopulmonary illness. So air pollution, of which particulates are a part of air pollution, um, are attributable to actually one out of every eight deaths globally, which is seven million deaths per year. So they're considered to be the most lethal environmental hazard by the World Health Organization. Um, and we can see the effects of particles on human health, both at high concentrations and at low concentrations. So I'm showing two pictures of high concentrations of, um, of aerosol particles and air pollution in general. Um, the first is of snow-covered mountains in Provo, Utah, this picture. Um, I like this picture because you can barely see anything at all. Um, but you can see that there's a lighter portion in the middle, or you might be able to see that there's a lighter portion in the middle, and that's the snow on the mountains. Um, and the bottom picture is a picture of Beijing last winter. The, it was in the news that there were really high <laughs> particulate levels in Beijing. Um, so this is a particular day where particulate levels were greater than 400 micrograms per meter cubed. And the World Health Organization um, wants us to keep um, particulate levels less than 25 micrograms per meter cubed, and anything above 100 is considered extremely dangerous. So these are very, very high particulate levels. And you can see by looking at either of those pictures, those are not atmospheres where you'd want to be breathing in the air. But we see the effects of particles even at low concentrations. So there was a famous study that was published in 1993 called the Harvard 6D study. Um, and this study looked at different atmospheric pollutants and um, and looked at their relationship to mortality rates. So they took um, uh, many different atmospheric pollutants, graphed them versus mortality rates, and looked for correlations. So when they took things like ozone, ozone we know is a respiratory irritant, but it showed no correlation with mortality rate. Whereas here, what I'm showing you is their plot of mortality rate versus fine particle concentration. 
And we're down around the levels where the EPA and the WHO wants us to be. So this um, number here is 25 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, and you can see that there's a direct correlation, even at low particulate concentrations, um, between uh, fine particle concentration and mortality rates. So even at low concentrations, particulates influence human health. Um, in terms of climate, to understand the effects of particles on climate, we first need to understand the climate system. Um, so I like using this cartoon to do this. So the sun is, can be modeled very well as a black body at about 6,000 Kelvin. So it emits radiation in the UV, the visible, and the near IR. And that radiation comes into the Earth. And some of it's reflected by clouds in the atmosphere. Sometimes it's reflected by the surface of the Earth. And some of it's absorbed by the, by the surface of the Earth. And so the Earth also achieves a temperature because it has this um, um, energy coming in. And so it also acts like a black body and it emits radiation as well. It doesn't emit as much radiation as the sun, of course, and emits radiation at much longer wavelengths than the mid-IR. Um, and if all that radiation escaped back out into space, the temperature of the Earth would be too cold to support life. So we're very fortunate to have a greenhouse environment that traps some of that light um, and allows the temperature of the Earth to rise to a level where it's habitable. The problem, of course, that we have now is that we're putting more and more greenhouse gases into the environment, which is causing the temperature of the Earth to continue to rise. So what I want you to get out of this picture is that the climate is determined by these energy balances, and that the atmosphere is a really important factor in this process. And so what we'd like to be able to do is we'd like to be able to take every component of the climate system and actually quantify how much of warming or cooling potential it has. And furthermore, we want to understand the effects of humans on this process. So we'd like to reference those values back to pre-industrial times. And the um, plot that does that, um, um, or the quantification that does that, is called radiative forcing. So this is a plot of radiative forcing from the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. Um, and the first one, so this is many different components of the atmosphere. So the first one is CO2, which is here. Um, we know that we've been putting CO2 into the environment since pre-industrial times. Uh, we know that CO2 is a greenhouse gas, which should cause a warming effect. So it has a positive radiative forcing, which is what we see here. And you can see that the uncertainty is quite small. So we understand really well how CO2 interacts in our climate system, which makes sense because we can put CO2 into an IR spectrometer, measure its absorption cross-section, and that's going to explain the interaction that it has in the atmosphere. As we go down this table, we see that there are these two effects of aerosol particles, which I'll get to in just a moment. Um, these have a net cooling effect on the, on the atmosphere. Um, and you can see that the uncertainties are quite large. So if we want to be able to better model our climate system, we need to reduce these uncertainties for how aerosols interact with, in our climate system in order to be able to better model, um, in a, better model the climate system in general. Okay, so what are these two effects? So to illustrate this, I have another cartoon where I have a layer of aerosol particles in the atmosphere. And when light interacts with these particles, it can either scatter off the aerosol particles or absorb into the aerosol particles. And the scattering and absorption of light by aerosol particles is called the aerosol direct effect. And aerosols are also composed of many, many different components, so that one of the most common components is water. And sometimes aerosol particles can pick up so much water that they become cloud droplets, or ice can nucleate on a particle. And all the interactions between aerosol particles and clouds and radiation is called the aerosol indirect effect. So what we do in my laboratory is we look at the structure of, of particles, and we look at how that structure affects um, aerosol physical and chemical properties that are related to the aerosol direct and indirect effect. And in the course of our research, we also have to develop a lot of techniques, a lot of methods to look at submicron particles and complex submicron particles. OK, so I'm still using the word structure, but I haven't defined what I mean by structure. And structure can mean many different things. Um, so I want to define what I mean by structure, and this is also serving as an outline for, for the talk. Um, so I mean structure broadly defined. Um, so I'll show you an example of structure in terms of surface structure and how surface structure influences ice nucleation, both in terms of functional groups on a surface and in terms of defects on surfaces. I'll show one slide only on shape of particles and how that influences their optical properties, and if anyone wants to know more information about that, I'm happy to talk to you about it later. Um, and then I'll end the talk by um, talking about internal structure of particles and how internal structure is um, dependent on size, um, looking specifically at phase separation in organic aerosol. Okay, so um, I mean structure probably defined, but why even study structure at all? Um, so it's been a long-standing paradigm in the chemical sciences, and I believe the physical sciences as well, that structure dictates function. 
And we see examples of this throughout, throughout the chemical and physics literature, chemistry and physics literature. So for quantum dots, your size determines your electronic properties. For proteins, the, um, the structure of your active site and the three-dimensional structure of your protein determines the selectivity and sensitivity and the activity of your protein. And for heterogeneous catalysis, there are numerous examples where surface structure influences activity. For spectroscopy, like surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, the structure of your substrate influences your, the sensitivity of your technique. And so the goal of my talk is to show you that, um, that particle structure is equally important to atmospheric chemistry because it determines properties of particles that are, um, that are important for their, um, for their uh, atmospheric chemistry and physics. Okay. But where I want to start is, is someplace different. Um, so almost all the work that I do, um, that my group does, is done in the laboratory where we can really control our particles. But I think it's really important for my students and for me to understand what particles actually look like in the environment. And so I had a really unique opportunity where I had a colleague, Krista Hazenkopf, who had a Fulbright and then an NSF International Research Fellowship to work in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. And she collected samples from my group to look at um, chemical composition, and she collected samples from Maggie Tolbert's group at the University of Colorado to look at ice nucleation activity. Um, and so, okay, why study, why study particles from Ulaanbaatar? So Ulaanbaatar is the capital city of Mongolia. It's where about 1.3 million people live, which is over half the population of Mongolia. Um, it's located in a semi-arid river valley, which means that especially during the winter, pollution gets trapped over the city. Um, and it's the coldest capital city in the world. And what, we, what, um, um, what people use in order to heat their homes, especially in the Gare district, which is the, um, where there are traditional homes, um, is inefficient cook stoves. The power plants in the city are also coal burning. And the coal that's burned in Mongolia is very polluted, so it includes a lot of sulfur. Um, when we look at Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, in terms of particulate matter less than 10 microns in diameter, so PM10, it's the second most polluted city in the world. Um, and when you look at the 10 most polluted cities and you look at the papers that have been written on them, it totals just 41 papers as of 2011. Whereas if we look at the cities that we associate, that we generally associate with air pollution, um, like Beijing and Mexico City and London and Los Angeles and Houston, um, these have much lower PM10 concentrations and they've been much better studied. And so it's really important to understand as a, as a baseline, where is pollution coming from in Ulaanbaatar? Um, so that if we try to institute changes there, we understand what effect those changes are having. Okay, so what do we see? So we classify particles first by their structure and then by their composition. So we see that they're irregular particles, which are shown here, which are mostly mineral dust, spherical particles, which are mostly sulfate and sulfate organic, um, and fractal particles, um, which are mostly soot. And here I'm showing both primary soot emission and um, um, a soot emission that has a condensate on it where it's partially collapsed. Um, we can also look at rough concentrations of particles, and we find that for all the different particle types, the concentrations are higher in the winter. And here I'm just showing um, an example for all particles. Um, and the blue, the, the blue represents the winter months. So those are highlighted, and you can see that the particulate concentrations are much higher then. If we want us to understand the effects of particles on human health, we need to look at their size. And so what we see is that all the spherical particles are less than about a micron in diameter. Um, almost all the soot particles, or fractal particles, are less than a micron in diameter. And almost all the irregular particles are less than 2.5 microns in diameter. So almost all the particles are deeply inhalable to, into the lungs, and so almost all of them are important for human health. We can also look at the effects of coal burning and uh, what effect that is going to have on particle chemistry. And we do that by tracking sulfur in our particles. Again, here the winter months are highlighted in blue, and I'm showing the results for spherical, fractal, and irregular particles. And the sulfur is indicated by the red. Um, and you can see that, the, that sulfur really increases in the winter months for all the different particle types. So we wanted to understand what effect that um, increase in sulfur would have on ice nucleation or on climate in general. Um, um, so we looked at its ice nucleation activity. And I'm going to show a bunch of plots that are related to ice nucleation activity. Um, and they're a little bit counterintuitive to read, so I wanted to show just an example plot before I start showing you data. Um, so uh, to quantify ice nucleation activity, we use a plot like this, where we graph supersaturation with respect to ice, 
versus temperature. And the vapor pressure for ice is less than the vapor pressure for water. So there's a huge area here where we're subsaturated with respect to liquid water, but super saturated with respect to ice. And that's the regime in which we're gonna look at ice nucleation. Um, and so if you need more relative humidity in order to get the onset of ice to occur, it means you have worse ice nucleation activity. So as you move up in this plot, you have worse ice nucleation activity. And there are many different types of ice nucleation and many different mechanisms. I just want you to think right now about deposition mode nucleation, where you have a salt particle, you have water vapor. The water vapor condenses on the salt particle and forms an ice crystal. So you have no liquid involved in, in this particular process. All right, so just to summarize what I just said, um, if you're high in the plot, you have poor ice nucleation activity. If you're low in the plot, you have better ice nucleation activity. So our results from Ulan Batar, again, the winter months are highlighted in blue. And we see that we need higher supersaturations in order to get ice to nucleate in the winter months. So we see a deactivation of ice nucleation activity in the winter. It's been observed in the laboratory that when you treat lots of different types of minerals with sulfuric acid, the ice nucleation activity decreases, but we don't understand why that deactivation occurs. Um, so um, in the first part of this talk, I want to show you um, why the deactivation occurs. So here's a generalized <coughs> scheme of what I just showed you. So we have particles that come from some source. They go over, they are transported over a polluted region. They interact with things like sulfuric acid. Um, they might form a reaction product, and we observe in the laboratory um, that it's deactivated with respect to ice nucleation. Okay. And while no one knows the chemical or physical reasons behind this process, there have been two main hypotheses. One is that the salt or the reaction product is what's causing the deactivation. The other is that um, the mineral surface, that there are changes to the mineral surface that, change, that causes deactivation. So I want to spend um, like about the next 20 minutes um, answering this question, is the deactivation due to changes in, to, due to the reaction product, or is it due to changes in the mineral surface? So we studied um, a couple of different minerals and a couple of different acids, and I'm just going to present the results for kaolinite um, with sulfuric acid. So um, kaolinite is a type of aluminosilicate clay mineral. Aluminosilicate clays are um, over half of Asian and African dust, so they're very relevant. Uh, kaolinite has been well studied as well. Um, and this is showing the structure of kaolinite, which we'll get into more as, as the talk goes on. Um, what I want you to see now is that um, kaolinates consist of octahedrally coordinated aluminum and tetrahedrally coordinated silicon. And there's one layer of aluminum for every layer of silicon. And there are lots of impurities in the mineral, and so the aluminosilicate sheets end up being negatively charged. And so there are cations that um, condense onto the, um, onto the sheets in order to neutralize the charge. So the experiment that we've done is we've taken kaolinite and we've reacted with sulfuric acid. We then take the mineral and separate out the supernatant. The supernatant we analyze for the cations that are in the supernatant. And the mineral we analyze through two techniques. We analyze them uh, using TEM to look at their morphology. And we analyze them using X-ray diffraction to look at their structure and composition. And I'm just going to present the results from X-ray diffraction. So X-ray diffraction is a great technique because it gives you a fingerprint for the minerals. Um, I just want you to focus on the top two um, lines in this diffractogram. The top one is showing untreated kaolinate. So what we see for untreated kaolinate is we have an impurity due to anatase, which is TiO2. We have an impurity due to quartz. And all the rest of the series of peaks is the fingerprint for kaolinate. When we treat the mineral with sulfuric acid, we see that there are two new peaks, which are indicated by these arrows. And when we think about all the cations that were coming off that we detect through ICPAS, and we think about which of those could react with sulfuric acid, and we look at which of those salts could appear in, in our um, X-ray diffraction spectrum, what we find is that these peaks are due to alunogen, which is hydrated aluminum sulfate, where we have aluminum sulfate with 17 waters. Certainly other salts could be formed, um, but they're not crystalline enough to be observed with X-ray diffraction, or they're formed in too small quantities to be observed. OK, so our picture of what's going on um, from our three techniques, of which I've shown you one, is that we have um, leaching of, of cations into solution, which we observe with ICPAS. We have roughening of the edges of the surface, which we observe with TEM. And then as the mineral is dried, 
um, we get alunogen, this aluminum sulfate, to form on the surface of the mineral. So what does this mean for ice nucleation? Um, so to do this, we collaborated with Maggie Tolbert's group. Um, and I'm showing you the same um, ice nucleation plot, uh, where I have super saturation with respect to ice versus temperature. And, um, and the black points are showing the untreated mineral. So you can see that this is nucleating at very low super saturations. That means that kaolinate is very active with respect to ice nucleation. When we treat it with sulfuric acid, we get the red points. So it requires more relative humidity to get, um, to get the reactive kaolinate to nucleate. That means that it's deactivated with respect to ice nucleation. Um, and we can compare this to literature. So um, Alan Bertram's group at UBC has also studied kaolinate. He studied a different type of kaolinate. Um, and he, for the untreated mineral, gets the purple points. As you can see, even though the composition is slightly different, he's getting about the same result for the untreated mineral. He then treats the minerals much more harshly um, than we do, and he gets the orange points up here. So he also sees deactivation. He sees much more deactivation, but it makes sense because he treats the minerals more harshly. Okay. What's also plotted on here are the results for hydrated aluminum sulfate. Um, these are the gray points. So there's a solid gray point here, and that's where alunogen or hydrated aluminum sulfate is um, nucleating ice at the same super saturation as the sulfuric acid treated mineral. And then um, at the two higher temperatures, we have these open circles. One is right here, and one is right here. Um, and here, hydrated aluminum sulfate took up water rather than nucleating ice. Okay, so why does the deactivation occur? Well, at higher temperatures, we have this reaction product taking up water. We still will have a heterogeneous nucleus inside of this water droplet. And so um, ice nucleation can still occur, but it will occur by condensation or immersion freezing rather than deposition freezing, rather than deposition mode freezing. Um, and so it's going to occur at the higher supersaturation. At the lowest temperature, we do have nucleation, deposition mode nucleation right on the surface of, that, of the reaction product. Um, and a way to describe what's going on is in terms of lattice spacings. So as a first approximation, very rough first approximation, uh, we can think of um, compounds that are close to having a lattice spacing of ice as being good ice nuclei. So here I'm showing the lattice parameters, um, the lattice parameters of ice. Kaolinate has close lattice parameters to ice, but actually nucleates ice well for a different reason, which I'll get into in a few slides. And here are the results for the lattice parameters of alunogen. And you can just see that this doesn't match the, the parameters for ice at all. This is going to be a horrible ice nucleus. Okay, so why does lattice spacing influence ice nucleation activity? So I have a cartoon um, showing um, epitaxial growth. So water, when it absorbs on a surface, does not grow epitaxially. But it's a good, um, it's a good explanation for what's going on um, for, for how lattice parameters matter for ice nucleation activity. So when we have perfect lattice match between the mineral and the ice, the first monolayer of water is going to lay down just fine um, it, um, because, because it has a great template. The second layer is going to lay down just fine. Um, and it's just going to keep propagating, no problem. When we have poor lattice match, then maybe the first layer of water lays down just fine on the surface because it can sort of negotiate to get um, around the areas where it needs to get. But then as we build up more and more ice on that surface, it's going to want to go towards the bulk structure of ice. And so there's going to be a lot of strain that develops in, in these multilayers, and that's going to inhibit epitaxial growth. Now, as we continue to increase the relative humidity, there's much more water in the system, and you will drive ice formation to occur, um, but that's going to occur at much, more, at much higher supersaturations. Um, it's going to also be much more defected ice. Okay, <laughs> so it seems convenient that lattice spacings in this case um, uh, can explain the ice nucleation activity. Um, and so are lattice spacings all we need to know in order to understand the ice nucleation activity of crystalline materials? And the answer to that is, of course, no. Even for kaolinite, we can't use lattice parameters to understand its ice nucleation activity. But my point is that structure is key, and lattice spacing is part of structure. So there are some cases where lattice parameters will give us an understanding of ice nucleation activity. Okay, so let's revisit the question that I asked at first. Is the deactivation due to the reaction product or is it due to changes in the mineral structure? And what I've shown you so far is that the product formation could explain the deactivation, but I haven't talked at all about the surface. And so in our next experiment, what we did was we rinsed off the, the acid-treated mineral 
to remove the soluble products and just like it changes to the surface. And we needed to know what to actually study on the surface because no one knows what the active sites for ice inclusion are on any atmospherically relevant material. Um, and so we looked at the literature to try to figure out what groups on the surface we should target. Um, and the old literature tells us that um, the basal plane of kaolinite has an ice-like arrangement of hydroxyl groups that promotes ice nucleation. And the basal plane is shown right here. So these are all the hydroxyl groups on the basal plane. But recent computational studies by Michaelides and by um, Bertram and Patey have shown that you can't build up multilayers on that basal plane, that, um, that, there's, that there's actually not good lattice match. Um, but they have shown that water adsorbs very strongly to edge sites, to edge hydroxyl groups. So we wanted to understand what was happening to the edge hydroxyl groups during acid treatment. Um, and we target at one particular type of hydroxyl group that appears on the surface. So every time we have a silicon on, on, the, on, an, on the edge, it has three bridging oxygens to the, to the bulk, and it has a hydroxyl group. And we call this a Q3 silanol, and it's the type of silicon that appears on the surface, uh, on, this, on the edges of this mineral. So um, what we've done is we've taken a probe molecule called TFS. This probe molecule has a CF3 group on the end, and it selectively binds to these types of hydroxyl groups. Um, and then we've analyzed the amount of fluorine using solid state NMR, and we can use the amount of fluorine to back out how many hydroxyl groups we have on the edges. Okay. So this is showing an NMR spectrum. We analyze the area under the main peak and the spinning sidebands in order to get the number of OH groups. What we observe is that um, this is the untreated mineral number of OH groups. And then as soon as we increase the acid concentration, we get these three points. These are statistically higher than the untreated mineral. Um, and then, of course, when we increase the acid concentration a lot, we get a much higher increase in, in the number of hydroxyl groups. Okay. We don't expect that this plot will be linear because the dissolution of kaolinate depends upon pH. So it makes sense that we're getting something that's nonlinear. Um, and what I want you to see is that the number of hydroxyl groups is increasing with acid treatment. All right, so what does this mean for ice nucleation? Well, we have to think about the ice nucleation experiment again. So in the ice nucleation experiment, what we do is we start at some point in supersaturation space. We slowly lower the temperature. We wait for ice to occur. Um, we slowly lower the temperature again. We wait for ice nucleation to occur, and et cetera. So there's a time scale associated with this experiment. Meanwhile, if we look at our, um, if we look at our surface, we have active sites on that surface. Um, and when water interacts with those active sites, it can interact elastically or inelastically. And sometimes when it interacts inelastically, water will find an active site and stick there. And then maybe on the time scale of the experiment, we'll get enough water molecules to, um, to adsorb onto that site or near that site, form a nucleus, and grow into an ice crystal. So as we increase the number of active sites, we're going to increase the probability that water finds an active site on the relevant time scale and grows into a visible ice crystal. But once we reach a certain number of, like, a sufficiently high number of active sites, water's always going to find an active site on, on the laboratory time scale. And so what we should observe is that we'll get an increase in ice nucleation activity until we have a sufficient number of active sites, and then we should see no increase in ice nucleation activity. So an increase in hydroxyl groups on a surface should either increase ice nucleation activity or have no effect, depending on the number of active sites that were originally on the surface. But a complication to this is that we never just blindly have hydroxyl groups on our surface. They're always bonded to either aluminum or silicon. And so we have to understand also what's happening to the aluminum and silicon. Um, and to do this, we use another technique. We use an FTR technique called DRIPS. Um, and DRIPS alone isn't surface sensitive. And so we use another pro molecule. And this time we use acetic acid. And acetic acid either hydrogen bonds with the surface or it, um, or it interacts through acid-base reactions with the surface. So here are drift spectra. The black is for the untreated mineral, and the red is for the acid-treated and rinsed mineral. Um, and what I'm showing you are different spectra. So these are the mineral plus acetic acid minus the spectrum of just the mineral. So all you're seeing are the groups on the surface that interact with acetic acid. And what we see is that there's a region due to hydroxyl groups. We can't analyze this quantitatively because it's saturated in our raw spectra. But we see that there's another region that's changing due to silicon and aluminum. Um, in, in particular, this peak um, that's marked with the arrow goes away. Um, and other peaks are changing in intensity. 
Okay, so in order to understand what's going on, we modeled the system computationally. Um, and we find that these are the four structures that are responsible for the peaks that I showed you in the last slide. The one where the peak goes away is due to the silicon acetate. Um, we leach a lot of silicon into our solution, so it makes sense that we would have reduced, um, a reduced amount of um, this type of structure on our surface. And then what's happening while we're changing intensities of others, well, the amount of silicon and aluminum both are getting leached to some extent into solution. Um, so the, amount, the relative amounts of them are changing, which means that our peak intensities are going to change. So my point overall is that surface groups are changing, right? So OH is increasing, silicon and aluminum are changing as well. So what effect does this have on ice nucleation activity? Um, so here's another plot of ice nucleation activity of supersaturation versus temperature. And some of these points you've seen before. So the blue is the untreated kaolinite. You've seen that before. The red is the acetreated mineral. You've seen that before. That shows the deactivation. And then the, there are green points that are right behind the blue points, so you can't see all of them. Um, and those are, those are the acetreated and rinsed mineral. So basically, there are all these changes to the surface, but it doesn't have any effect on ice nucleation activity. OK, so let's revisit the question that I asked originally. Um, is the deactivation that, that is observed when we treat minerals with acids, or when we treat specifically kaolinite with sulfuric acid, is it due to the reaction product, or is it due to changes in the mineral surface? And what I've shown is that the formation of the product explains the deactivation. That certainly the surface is changing. We're increasing OH groups. We're changing silicon and aluminum. But it has no effect on ice nucleation activity. All right, so this whole study of ice nucleation has looked at functional groups on surfaces and how they influence ice nucleation activity. But functional groups aren't the only th things on surfaces that can influence ice nucleation activity. We could also have defects on surfaces influencing ice nucleation activity. So in order to understand the role of defects in um, specifically water adsorption, which is the first step of ice nucleation, we filled an ultra-high vacuum chamber equipped with an AFM, a mass spec for temperature program desorption studies, and an FTR. Um, for transmission and reflection absorption um, FTR studies. And I just want to show you some very, very preliminary data from that instrument, from our first experiment on that instrument. So we start working with NACL. It's a very easy system to work with in a UHV chamber, in an ultra vacuum chamber. So what we see on um, just a plain sodium chloride surface is that we have large terraces, and we have, um, and we have step edges. Um, and then when we treat the surface with some monolayer concentrations of water and desorb it off and look at the surface again, nothing has really changed. We have large terraces, we have step edges. We then take 20 monolayers of water and absorb it to the surface and then desorb it off. And you see that when, once we do that, um, we have a very different surface where we have many, many more defects. So we want to understand the effect of those defects on water interactions with the surface. To do that, we use temperature program desorption spectroscopy. So basically what we do is we take the submodel air concentrations, we desorb it off, and we look at the temperature profile of the desorption. So at what temperatures is the water coming off? So when we first have our, our plain surface and we, um, and we absorb submodel air concentrations and absorb it off, we see two peaks. Um, the second of these peaks, the higher temperature peak, is due to water substrate or water uh, defect interactions. And then when we take our highly defected surface and we absorb some monolayer concentrations and desorb them off, um, then we see again that there are two peaks. But the peak due to water substrate or water defect interactions has changed to, has shifted to much lower temperatures. Okay, so there's an effect of surface roughening here that we're still trying to understand, um, that we're still trying to understand fully. Briefly, what's, what we know so far is that Presumably, when water adsorbs to the surface, it adsorbs at step edges or, um, or defect sites. It then spreads out along the terraces. When we adsorb a lot of water to the surface, then we're getting the defect formation once we desorb that water off. Um, and then once we adsorb some monolayer concentrations to that highly defected surface, um, we have many more defects available. We have different types of defects available. And so there's a change in the interaction of water with the surface. Um, the previous literature um, on other types of surfaces that get roughened, and you look at the interaction of water with them, show that there is a shift in that water substrate peak, but we're still trying to understand exactly what's going on for sodium chloride. Okay, so now I've shown you um, a lot of information about surface structure and how it influences ice nucleation, both in terms of functional groups and in terms of defects. I'm going to show you one slide on shape of particles and how that influences their optical properties.
And then um, in the last 10 minutes of the talk, um, I'll show you how internal structure of particles depends on size. Okay. Um, so we spent a lot of time in the group looking at uh, shape of particles and how that influences their optical properties. Um, and we were interested in this because the main technique that everyone uses to slice life particles um, at DMA um, is uh, the theory for it's only created for spherical particles. Um, and people use DMAs all the time for ice nucleation experiments, for optical property experiments, et cetera. So we wanted to understand the, what would happen if we start using non-spherical particles um, with the system. So what I'm showing here is a TM picture of calcite particles. Calcite particles are, um, they're cubic, so they're about as close as you can get to being spherical for a non-spherical system. And you can see that we have, um, you can see that this looks horrible as a size selection, right? Um, that we have a huge polydispersity of different, of different sizes. Um, and we can analyze that more exactly by graphing um, these versus area equivalent diameter. The red is the, what we should get for spherical particles. And you can see that this is much more polydispersed. Not surprisingly, when we look at the optical properties of, of calcite, we find that we need to include this polydispersity in order to understand the optical properties. And when we work with compounds like hematite, we need to also include the effect of shape on the optical properties of hematite particles. So we've worked with many different systems. We have two papers published. We have three more in preparation. And if anyone wants to talk to me about it further, I'm, I'm happy to talk about optical properties. Um, but I'd like to move on and, and look at phase separation and submicron organic aerosol. So a mock-up of what we're interested in studying is when we have organic um, molecules that are um, that are emitted into the atmosphere, um, either something like isoprene and terpene from biogenic emissions or toluene and xylene derivatives from urban emissions. Those will get oxidized, they'll interact with relative humidity, they'll interact with seed particles, and they might, and they might condense on a particle and form particles, and the particles can have many different structures. All right, so why do we care if a particle has different structures? So I have a cartoon um, where I'll explain this, um, and I have three different types of particles, and I'm showing three different morphologies. Um, the particle is composed of an organic component, or organic rich component, which is red. Um, there's an inorganic aqueous component, which is blue. When you mix the red and the blue together to get a homogeneous particle, it's purple. Um, so here's the homogeneous particle, and there are two phase-separated particles. And the difference between these phase-separated particles is that the bottom one is partially engulfed. That means both the organic rich component and the inorganic aqueous component have access to the air. Whereas for the core shell particle, the organic rich component completely coats the aqueous inorganic component. So when we have a primary emission, um, um, and that gets oxidized in the atmosphere, to form a secondary organic compound, because of thermodynamic considerations like light dissolves light, that compound may prefer to be in, in an organic rich phase rather than in, um, in a homogeneous particle. So understanding phase separation behavior can help us understand the mass of particulate matter in the atmosphere, which is important for both human health and climate. The morphology of particles also um, is influential to their optical properties. Um, so morphology could influence radiative balance, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the last few slides of the talk. Um, and then in terms of reactive uptake or water, um, water uptake, um, a reactant needs to reach an actocyte on the surface in order to react. Water needs to interact with the right types of compounds on the surface of a particle in order to be uptaped into the particle. And so here I'm showing a cartoon of a reactant that wants to react with the aqueous inorganic component. And so it can do so on the homogeneous particle or on the partially engulfed particle, but on the core shell particle it cannot. So understanding um, morphology is also influential to understanding heterogeneous chemistry and cloud formation. So the experiment that we ran first was the same as, um, was a repeat of what's in the literature, which is always a good place to start. So we took two different organic compounds mixed with ammonium sulfate. I'm showing pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate on top, and succinic acid and ammonium sulfate on the bottom. And we took these large, large aqueous droplets, and we started drying them out. And what we observed for something like pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate is as we dry it out, we get phase separation, liquid-liquid phase separation to occur. Um, where we have um, an organic rich component on the outside and an aqueous inorganic component on the inside. And then eventually we get crystallization. For succinic acid and ammonium sulfate, um, we see no liquid-liquid phase separation prior to crystallization. 
And the honest record literature has given us a sense of for simple organic compounds, um, like dicarboxylic acids, um, where we should transition between having liquid-liquid phase separation versus having no liquid-liquid phase separation. And for this type of compound, um, that, um, that boundary occurs at an O to C ratio of 0.7. So if you have an O to C ratio below 0.7, you get liquid-liquid phase separation. If you have an O to C ratio above 0.7, you get no liquid-liquid phase separation. Um, o to C, of course, is not a measure of functional groups. It's not a measure of chemistry, but it's helpful because it's something that we measure in the field. Okay. So, um, so all these experiments that have been run um, to date have either been run either using um, optical tweezer apparatus or optical microscopy. And so all these experiments that have been done have been done on particles that are greater than a micron in size. But most organic aerosol in the atmosphere is less than 500 nanometers in diameter. So we wanted to understand what happens to aerosol structure in the submicron regime. And to do this, we used two techniques. We used cryotransmission electron microscopy to look at dry aerosol particles. And we looked at cavity renowned spectroscopy. And looked at them using cavity renowned spectroscopy as well. What we observe is that for dry particles, what's important is the aqueous solubility of the organic component rather than the O to C ratio. Um, but our results do agree with, um, with the liquid-liquid phase separation results as well. So for soluble organic compounds, what we observe is that we see these particles that have no contrast across the particle. Um, and so these are homogeneous particles. All these compounds have O to C ratios greater than 0.7. None of them are going to undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. They are going to crystallize, but water is going to reta be retained in the structure when they get crystallized. Um, and so water acts as a plasticizer, and so they stay homogeneous. For insoluble organic compounds, what we observe is we see phase separation. So you can see now that there are two different components of the particle. There's a darker portion, which is the ammonium sulfate, and there's a lighter portion, which is the organic rich phase. Um, these are all compounds that have O to C ratios less than 0.7, so they all undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. Uh, Liquid-liquid phase separation has a salting out effect, so as you continue to decrease the relative humidity and continue to dry out the particle, you'll continue to raise the salt concentration, so everything will stay phase separated. Um, what you also see in these pictures is that for subaric acid, we have partially engulfed particles, whereas for adipic and azelaic acid, we have a com combination of partially engulfed and core shell particles. But whether you end up with something that's core shell or partially engulfed is thermodynamic. And so you have to only end up with one of those types of structures. So if we think about our experiment, what we're doing is we're um, making particles in the gas phase and then impacting them on TM grids. And so the particles can land on any orientation on that TM grid. So if we start with something that's core shell, it's always going to look core shell. And there are organic compounds that we work with that are core shell. Um, but when we take something that's partially engulfed and we impact on the TM grid, depending on the orientation, it might look partially engulfed or it might look core shell. And so when we see a combination like we do here, it means that the particles are partially engulfed. So all of these dicarboxylic acids form partially engulfed structures. What's really interesting is what happens at intermediate solubilities. So here I'm showing you pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate and succinic acid mixed with ammonium sulfate. And um, for pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate, actually for both of them, when we have large particle sizes, we see partially engulfed compounds, uh, partially engulfed particles. When we have small particle sizes, we observe homogeneous particles. Okay. So in the case of pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate, when we have large particles, these undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. For succinic acid and ammonium sulfate, our, um, our O to C ratio is too high. These do not undergo liquid-liquid phase separation. So they must be phase separating upon crystallization. Um, you can see the size dependence much more clearly using a histogram. So here I'm showing um, um, different particle types versus their area equivalent diameter. And what you see is that all the small particles are homogeneous, all the large particles are phase separated. And the transition is occurring at about 270 nanometers for pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate, and about 170 nanometers for succinic acid and ammonium sulfate. Okay, so what's going on? So we know for aerosol particles, when we get small enough, we see differences in behavior. So for example, crystallization behavior of particles changes below about 40 nanometers. But we're seeing um, a difference at much larger sizes. And so while there could be an underlying confinement effect, um, there are probably kinetic effects occurring as well. Um, so we don't know what our viscosity of our particles is, but if our particles were viscous, 
then we'd have a kinetic effect um, that would result in the size dependence as well. Where is, if we have a viscous particle, it's going to take longer for water to get out of the particle. It's going to take longer for um, a new phase to be nucleated. So if we have a small particle, just because it's small, water is going to take um, a shorter time to get out of the particle, and we might not have time to nucleate a new phase, which would mean that this small particle would stay homogeneous. Whereas for a large particle, just because it's large, water is going to take a little bit longer to get out of the particle, and we might have time to nucleate a new phase, um, in which case the large particle would be phase separated. So right now in my laboratory, we're trying to figure out to what extent the size dependence we observe is kinetic versus thermodynamic. We've also looked at the effects of aerosol particles of the morphology on optical properties. And to do this, we've used cavity renowned spectroscopy. We've worked with two different particle types, um, pimelic acid and ammonium sulfate, which is um, partially engulfed, and 126-hexane trial mixed with ammonium sulfate, which is core shell. Um, and we've extracted from the cavity renowned experiment the effect of real part of the refractive index and graphed this versus the fraction of organic by weight. The lines are showing the results for homogeneous particles, and the points are showing the phase separated particles. So there are two things to notice here. One is that there's a difference when you have a phase separated particle um, versus a homogeneous particle in terms of their optical properties. The other thing to notice is that it doesn't really matter whether you're partially engulfed or core shell. They have very similar optical properties. Okay, so what effect does this have on radiative forcing? So we used a very simple model developed by Chilek and Wong um, to um, calculate the ratio of uh, radiative forcing for a phase separated particle um, ratio to a homogeneous particle. And what we observe is that you, if you assume a particle is homogeneous rather than core shell or partially engulfed, you might be missing up to 5% of the scattering. Um, and this effect might be greater if the particles were absorbing rather than non absorbing. So what I've shown you is I've demonstrated the use of cryo-TM for the study of aerosol phase separation in submicron particles. Um, in the, these dried particles, organic solubility rather than O to C ratio is what dictates your structure. Um, at intermediate solubilities, there's this very interesting size dependence. Um, and partially engulfed in core shell particles have similar optical properties that are different than those of homogeneous particles. So where I started this talk was to tell you how important structure um, um, was to function in ch the chemical sciences, and um, to, um, to state that the goal of my talk was to show you that particle structure was equally important to atmospheric chemistry. And I've shown you a couple examples of that. So for surface structure and how it relates to ice nucleation, we looked at the question of whether the deactivation due to acid treatment of minerals was due to reaction product or changes in the mineral structure. And I showed you that for kaolinate and sulfuric acid, formation of the product explains the deactivation. And there are changes to the structure, but they're not influencing the ice nucleation activity. Um, and then for um, internal structure, I've shown that there's a size dependence on morphology, and that optical properties depend on whether you're phase separated or homogeneous. So I just want to end by acknowledging the students who have worked on this project, um, so, um, and, and my collaborators as well. So Valerie did the experiments on um, drips and the ultra vacuum chamber. Mohammed works on organic aerosol. Robbie's just getting trained on the UHV apparatus. Um, Sarah um, worked on the X-ray diffraction and NMR studies. And Dan is my senior student, um, and he's done a huge number of projects in lab. Um, so he's done the mineral dust and how shape influences optical properties. Um, he's researched um, the Mongolia project, and he generated our first two papers on an organic aerosol. I also had an undergraduate, Nick Glickey, who contributed to the X-ray diffraction studies. And my collaborators for the work that I showed are Greg Schill and Maggie Tilbert um, at the University of Colorado, who did the ice nucleation work, um, Kelly Murphy and Carl Mueller at Penn State, who helped us with the NMR studies, and Jim Kubicki, also at Penn State, who, um, who helped us with the computational studies for the DRIPS experiment. Um, and funding for these projects has come from Penn State and NSF Career Award and um, Shared Instrument Time at EMSL. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions? I have a question. So you sh you, one of your slides shows uh, in homogeneous particle to core shell, you have 4% increase for yeah. So I wonder the ratio, will, will that ratio depend on the particle size? Whether that ratio depends on 
particle size. We are the ratio of dependent particle size. Um. Oh, it's it's a size. Oh, it's so, versus diameter. Yes. So yes. Yeah. So yes, yeah, a little bit surprising. It's a four percent. is a little bit uh, lower than previous studies. So, well, um, I'm, I'm not sure. To, I'm not aware of previous studies that have been able to resolve the morphology and then comment on. Oh, but there could be theoretical studies. So um, so this is also one wavelength, not multiple wavelengths. So this is only 643 nanometers. Okay. So you do get um, these oscillations will um, will settle out, and you might get a slightly different number if you're including many wavelengths. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Nice talk. Um, so the systems you looked at involve like mostly dicarboxylic acid. It seems. Yeah kind of have an artificially high O to C ratio anyway. So, I mean, could you generalize what you concluded to, say, things with nitrogen in or alcohols rather than just acids? What would you think? Um, that's an area where we're moving into to try to figure out um, what should happen when you add nitrogen and how phase separation might be slightly different of alcohol groups versus acid groups versus other sorts of groups. Any other questions? I was just wondering how you generated the mixed uh, organic and organic particles. Um, those are all just atomized. Okay. So we just take an aqueous solution of the components that we want to study, atomize it, dry it out, and that's how we get the particles. So you don't think it'd be any different if you had an a inorganic seed and then condensed organics onto it? The, it's just thermodynamically going to go those same directions? Um, yeah, so, um, so we could run that experiment, but we haven't, where we take an inorganic seed, condense organics on it, expose it to relative humidity, and see what morphology we get. In terms of thermodynamics, we should get the same result, um, but it would be interesting to try. Any others? All right, let's, oh, one more question. Can you guys pass this back? Oh, we're recording it, so it's good to have them recorded. <laughs> Looking at downwind of China, mm -hmm. do you think that the um, phenomena that you've demonstrated here are going to affect the clouds that one sees? Um, so there, there are different things that can happen when you reduce the ice nucleation activity of the mineral. So certainly if you have a soluble product, you might end up getting CCN to form rather than ion which means that you're going to form um, cumulus clouds rather than, than ice clouds, which are going to have very different optical properties. Um, if those particles are still forming ice clouds, then, um, then they're not going to be as efficient at forming ice clouds. And so again, your optical properties of your ice clouds are going to change. Um, but in terms of exactly figuring out what effect that has on clouds, which would be incredibly interesting to do, um, it depends both on meteorology and on chemistry. But that would be, it'd be very interesting to model. But briefly, that's what, what should be happening for the system. All right, if there's no more questions. There we are. OK. You guys are all shy. Um, the deactivation, does it, um, how does it affect the human health? Is, um, um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good question. Um, so how does the deactivation affect human health? Yeah, is the pollution higher if it's um, deactivated? Um, so um, it's a good question because it's, it's not one I particularly have the answer to. So, um, so if particles end up high enough in the atmosphere that they're forming clouds, they're not low enough down that we're breathing them in. Um, if they get rained out, then um, if they get rained out, especially if they form cumulus um, clouds and get rained out, then they're removed um, from, the, from the atmospheric system, um, and so we won't breathe them in again. Um, if they form ice clouds, they're just going to evaporate, and we could eventually see them if they get low enough in the atmosphere eventually again. Um, and then, and then it's, it's worth stating that no one, very little, is known about how composition of a particle influences its health effects. So if you have just an untreated um, mineral versus a reactant mineral, 
I don't think anyone knows the effects of those different types of minerals and compositions on human health. And so that would be an interesting thing. Well, in, in general, the effect of composition on human health effects is very interesting. Right now, what we have basically is a size measure. There's a little bit known about how composition influences human health, but not very much. Okay, are there any more questions? All right, in that case, let's thank Miriam one more time. <laughs>